Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. You know, leave it to our producer, Billy Miller. Today we're broadcasting from the field. Our executive producer wanted to make sure we're getting action, you know, what's going on in the country. So our, just like our founding president, Dr. Michael DeBakey invented the MASH, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, you know, which is intended to get to the fronts. Billy Miller wants to be publishing and, pro and producing from the field. So today we're coming to, uh, to you from a court quarantine unit. Uh, it's designed to take care of high-risk patients over the age of 65 with comorbid conditions like hypertension, otherwise known as my backyard. So welcome to my quarantine. Uh, you know, so I'm COVID positive, probably got exposed to events last uh, last week, just as we were beginning to in, re implement the mask order to indoor events. Everyone was supposed to be vaccinated and boosted, but you know, we didn't check PCR and sure enough, I'm positive on uh, COVID and doing just fine, by the way. One bad day, and everything's fine. So let's look at the world that's going on. Shanghai finally is just recovering after being closed down for almost a month. There's another city, Macau in China, that is well known for gambling and tourist uh, industry. It's just closed down, a huge uh, outbreak there. And the UN and a bunch of agencies like the WHO are beginning to look at the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic on many different countries. And most interesting, uh, in Latin America in particular, a lot of the students have lost almost half of their uh, time in school, and they are really falling behind math and uh, you know other skills. And the concern, of course, is what's going to happen over the next 10 to 15 years is this generation of kids, including our own, uh, have grown up and missing a lot of school in the last two years. And of course, in Wimbledon news, uh, Matteo Berrettini, you know, tested positive and he's out. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for those of you big Joker fans, Novak is now to the semifinals. Since he's not a big believer in being a role model for vaccines, I actually hope he loses. But that's just between us. He'll probably win. So uh, in the world today, uh, cases are going up. Uh, they're sort of going up worldwide. The cases are up about 50%, although not at a huge high number. But the most important thing is Europe is going back up. You know, I told you Europe is back down. Well, Europe is beginning to go on the rise again. The U.S. is still about flat. In the United States, uh, we've been flat for several weeks. The number of cases is between 95 and 110,000 each day. Uh, but, you know, the most amazing thing is the regional differences are striking. So the Northeast is coming down and the West and South are going up. But overall, the country's flat. Hospitalizations remain about flat with about 32,000 people hospitalized. Intensive care units have been about the same, about 4,000. And most importantly, mortality really hasn't changed. So we're, we're below 400 cases a day. When you think back on it, we were at tw over 2,500 mortalities a day. So, you know, we're much better off. And you can see that in the data, you know, there's a flattening of the curve now. We had a big peak of Omicron, and now we're just starting the summer doldrums. I feel like it could be in August in any year, just infections going on. And if you look at the regional difference, the differences are striking. Northeast, very low. West and the South in particular coming up. And in Texas, we've seen a surge in Harris County and, of course, our friends at Guinea County. In Harris County, we're now up to almost 300 cases per 100,000 and 16 hospitalizations, which puts us at a, a high-risk group. And remember, last week, we were between moderate and high. We put in, re implemented the mask order because of that. And right before that, we, I, we had these two events that I went to, and wouldn't you know, that's probably where, probably where I got it. Uh, Dimmick County has become a high-risk county. They now have almost 500 cases per 100,000 and 10 hospitalizations. So they're in a surge just like us. So as I said before, you know, because the cases now are very hard to follow because so many people are testing positive at home, like me, you know, I didn't call it a health department, I probably should have, but I didn't. Uh, so the cases are not really accurate. So things like wastewater are really important. Just like what's going on with the cases, the Northeast is down, Midwest and South are up, and the West is up. And here in Houston, we continue to see a pretty significant rise. We're now at 636% of the value we were July 6, 2020. And it's taken a while, you know, we've talked about what the dominant variant is, 
but it's taken a while, but BA5 is the dominant variant in more than BA4. So BA5 is now more than 50% of the cases. Uh, BA4 and BA2.12 are about the same. So BA4 may never take over, but BA5 definitely is. And I'm praying, I hope I got BA5 because that's the one variant that is happening because they're immune escape. So it's just like getting another vaccination against the BA5, but I, ho I hope so. And BA5 is now the dominant variant in all parts of the United States. You can tell by these circle diagrams, except for the Northeast. So BA5 is really responsible for this latest surge. But why are we not doing as badly, you know, in terms of mortality as many of you think? And I think there's some really interesting data. Right now, there's been a finally done a pretty good uh, prevalence study. You remember I talked about zero prevalence now is the only way to really figure out how many people have been infected because we can't go, go by just history. You need to test people and you can tell the difference between a vaccinated person and someone who's been naturally infected because if you get vaccinated you only have antibodies to the spike protein. But if you've been naturally infected you have antibodies to other parts of the virus. And so a large study was done on over about 5,000 people nationwide to look at the prevalence and they looked at the difference between people who just been, you know, had just spike protein and people who had uh, uh, antibodies to other parts of the virus. And it looks like the zero prevalence now is about 57, 58% of the country. So 58% of the country has been infected using the, the nuclear capsid antigen test. So when you think about it, 223 million people have been uh, fully vaccinated, the country's 330 million or so, 223 have been vaccinated, about half the population has been infected, so we have a pretty broad natural immunity and vaccine immunity across the country to at least all the strains before BA5 and 4. So I think that explains why we're not seeing this huge spike. The country actually is pretty resistant. It's, you know, it, there will be these escape mutants like the BA5 and 4 mutant, but by and large, we have memory cells, we have some antibody responses, so I think the country is pretty well protected. Now, we've talked a little bit about estimating, you know, how many cases have been worldwide, and most people are using excess deaths over and above what's expected. And there were two papers, one actually The Economist has done a modeling experiment, and then there's a paper published using some of that data, and a couple of authors in The Lancet. And while the net worldwide estimate for global deaths is about 6 million, excess deaths using the, the model that uh, was developed by the Financial Times is about 20 million. And many people have thought that. It's about three or four times more than what has been estimated. And if you look at it, it's really fascinating. They do a day-by-day -day analysis. And here I've shown you, based on the Alpha Peak, the Delta Peak, and the Omicron Peak, down here in the blue, uh, uh, line, you can see that area of the curve represents COVID deaths that are actually reported, and then the red sp spikes represent excess mortality. And the re reason that makes sense is it, it also, those peaks correlate perfectly with each of the peaks of Alpha, Delta, Omicron. So it's pretty clear, while those, you don't see those peaks in the COVID reported deaths, it's pretty clear that the excess mortality correlates better. Uh, with the peaks of the virus than, uh, than just the reported deaths. We, we've known this, but here's good d data that was published both in the Financial Times and Lancet. And when you think about that, the, the paper in the Lancet suggested that th there have been, uh, you know, a lot of deaths averted because of the vaccine rollout. And using models to look at what was predicted, what's expected versus after the rollout of vaccines, the vaccines have saved about 20 to 24 million people worldwide. So the vaccines, you know, people argue about it, have been incredibly effective. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not equally distributed. If you look at where the countries that are most benefited, the, like in purple here, those are the, company, the countries that can afford to buy the vaccine. So this is what the WHO has been worried about all along, uh, that there's the inequity in vaccine distribution, which actually correlates directly to the number of lives saved. So I want to end today because of public service uh, announcement from Lily. Uh, she wants me to, t I told her it wasn't really newsworthy, but she insisted, she absolutely insisted, first reported case of a person getting COVID from a cat. So there's a scientist in Thailand who, who, who has reported this, 
couple, a family came in infected with COVID, and don't ask me why, but they swabbed the cat. The cat was positive. Well, they gave the cat to the veterinarian, and the veterinarian was masked, uh, wearing gloves, uh, was holding the cat, and the cat sneezed on him. And it did not have eye protection. Later on, the vet tested positive for the same strain as that cat. So there's no question, absolutely no question, that cats can transmit to people, although it's very, very rare. Lily, I know, I know. I'm telling them, I'm telling them, all right, I'd say. She just suggests getting rid of all cats until the end of the pandemic. So I wanted to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First, I want to congratulate Dr. Peter Hotez and uh, Dr. Maria Elena Batazzi for being listed in the 10 groundbreaking medical innovations that are dramatically changing healthcare um, outcomes for the Corbivax vaccine. That came from Better Magazine. Congratulations, Peter and Elena, once again. They're going to have to have a separate house to collect all the hardware. Uh, and a special shout out to two of our medical students who created Tuesday's New York Times crossword puzzle. Congratulations to Margaret Nuwakaska and Eileen Williams. Now, I just want to let you know one thing. My sister, my sister Janet, is addicted to the New York Times. And she, I'm going to see how well she did with it, but she does it every day. It's one of her mental health things. But, you know, just between us, Tuesday is supposed to not be as hard as like Sunday. But anyway, my sister wants to send a special shout out to you. So thank you so much. I'll be coming back out of quarantine and I can't wait to see you next week.